And now, Fritz Perl's Gestalt Therapy. The word Gestalt is not readily translated into English. As it is used during this presentation, your understanding of it will develop. Roughly speaking, we may think of a Gestalt as a whole, or as a pattern or configuration, or as a coordination of parts, which when organized becomes more than just a summation of individual parts. The holistic doctrine states that man is a unified organism. We do not have arms and legs, a liver and a heart. It is somewhat more accurate to say we are arms and legs, a liver, a heart, a brain, and so on. But we are more than just a summation of parts. We are a highly complex coordination of interworking parts. Receiving a brand new Rolls Royce with a key in the ignition and a tank full of gas is quite different than having a huge box arrive on your doorstep containing all the necessary parts. No organism is self-sufficient. An organism can only exist in an environmental field. To effectively study human behavior, a person must be observed in the context of his or her environment. Every organism must obtain essential substances to maintain life. In order to do this, it must contact the environment. In a healthy person, aggression is not bad. It is the means whereby the person contacts his environment and obtains what he needs. The ongoing exchange between organism and environment is called metabolism. Homeostasis refers to the tendency of the organism to maintain its equilibrium and health by interacting with the environment to satisfy its many needs for food, oxygen, elimination, and so on. It is the inborn process of automatic self-regulation. When an imbalance is felt, the organism surveys the environment with its sensory system. It looks, listens, smells, tastes, and touches. When it locates what it needs, it uses the motoric system to take action, to manipulate itself or the environment to secure the object it needs, which will restore the homeostasis and close the gestalt. For example, a hungry person might look for and find an apple tree. Then he might climb the tree or shake it in order to obtain an apple. Emotions are the driving force behind all our actions. The organism experiences a positive cathexis toward objects in the environment which restore equilibrium. Objects such as food, water, oxygen and a negative cathexis toward objects which upset the equilibrium or threaten survival. It could be in clement weather or seeing a natural predator. In order to avoid negatively cathected objects, the organism strives to remove them from the environmental field. The organism will use fight or flight. It will either make contact and annihilate the dreaded object or it will withdraw. When the cathected object has been obtained or removed from the environmental field, or when the organism has withdrawn and is safe, the gestalt is closed. Contact and withdrawal are part of the very rhythm of life itself. In the daytime we make contact with the world. At nighttime we withdraw. Behavior is organized in patterns. For example, the sensing of hunger leads to the obtaining of food and the eating, digesting, and assimilating of the food. The desire for sexual relations leads to the experience of orgasm, which closes the gestalt. Having an emotion evoked, such as anger, love, joy, or grief, leads to the outward expression of it. If the pattern once set into action is not completed, it continues to exert a force on the organism. It seeks completion or closure. When closure has not occurred, we say there is an incomplete gestalt. The most important incomplete gestalt, 
will always emerge to be acted on first. The object in the environment which will satisfy the organism's dominant need becomes the foreground figure. All other objects in the environment will recede into the background. Pearls gives a classic example of a deer which is hungry. First it stops to eat, but then it spots a lion and begins to run for its life. Then, feeling exhausted, it stops to catch its breath. Each behavior is a function of the most pressing need at that point in time. A person's dominant need or interest will determine which element in the field will stand out. Pearl's example of people arriving at a cocktail party continues to clarify this point. The person interested in art will scan the field for all the paintings and sculptures. The single male will be on the lookout for attractive women. The alcoholic will find his way to the bar before meeting the guests. The person who needs a restroom will be unable to maintain focus on people's names or conversations until he or she is relieved. The hungry person will find the hors d'oeuvres first, and the person who really doesn't want to be there will experience the whole thing as a place of confusion until he or she becomes interested in something, a conversation, the food, the view from the backyard, or the structure of the house. Only then will the foreground emerge clearly and the background recede. Motivation has a strong effect on perception. The perceiver, depending on his needs, scans the environment for the object which will satisfy the need and close the gestalt. However, he is not a passive receiver. The perceiver screens what he sees and what he hears in accordance with his inner needs. It is well known that a hungry person will perceive food even when it may not be present. His need is so strong and his desire to find it is so great that it causes him to have misperceptions. For the organism to be healthy, to satisfy its needs and close the gestalt, it must be able to do two things. Number one is to be aware of its needs, especially its most dominant need. And number two, be able to manipulate both itself and its environment to satisfy those needs. If a person is unable to determine his dominant need or interest, or if the person is unable to secure from the environment the object which will satisfy the dominant need, his behavior will become disorganized and ineffective. When a person is not able to decide between two or more needs, he experiences a conflict. He becomes hazy and confused. The neurotic is a person who is unable to distinguish which needs are more important at a specific point in time. The organism is born with the capacity to live effectively. It brings with it an inborn self-regulating system which functions automatically to sense what the organism needs and to direct the organism's behavior to obtain what is needed from the environment to complete or close the gestalt. The neurotic is a person who has developed unhealthy habits of interrupting himself, of interfering with his own inborn capacity for self-regulation and health. Gestalt therapy focuses on helping clients discover how they are interrupting themselves from completing a gestalt and helping clients finish up unfinished situations. A person's ego boundary is dependent upon the processes of identification and alienation. Everything identified with is inside the ego boundary. Family, friends, teams, clubs, occupations, religions, countries. Inside there is good, right, and familiarity. Everything we feel alienated from is outside the ego boundary. Outside there is suspicion, unfamiliarity, strangeness, and badness. According to Pearls, the organism has needs for psychological contact as well. The psychological needs are also homeostatically regulated 
whenever the psychological equilibrium is imbalanced. Psychological events take place at what Pearls referred to as the contact boundary between a person and his environment. Man has a need for relatedness to other human beings. In Gestalt psychology, man is seen as an individual and as a social being. The person who can sustain a balanced concern for his individual needs and the needs of society will be healthy. Too much contact and his deeper human nature will be neglected. Too little contact and he will suffer from feelings of alienation and loneliness. Like each part of the body, instinctively understanding its specific function in relation to the whole, each individual must recognize the contact boundary where there is a healthy balance between himself and society. Man's inborn sense of balance works just fine until the time comes that the group's needs clash with the needs of the individual. When the group needs the individual to participate, but the individual needs to withdraw, the conflict begins. The individual must take action. He must make contact or he must withdraw. He must be able to discriminate which is the dominant need. When he cannot decide or when he does not feel satisfied with his decision, he is unable to make good contact or an effective withdrawal. An example of an individual who leans too heavily on society for satisfying personal needs is a criminal. An individual who allows society to lean too heavily on him is neurotic. The criminal does not see the needs of society. The neurotic cannot see his own needs. Many personality disturbances stem from this inability of the individual to maintain the balance between himself and society. Pearls distinguished between the end gain and the means whereby. The end gain is that object in the environment which will satisfy the organism's need. It is fixed, not changeable. On the contrary, the means whereby is quite variable. A hungry person can obtain any one of a number of foods and in a wide variety of ways, and the food can be prepared and served in even more ways. The organism's built-in self-regulating system works to secure the end gain, to satisfy the biological needs and sustain life. The individual has freedom of choice as to how the needs will be satisfied. The means whereby is not regulated by the organism. However, this is where the individual begins to feel the clash between himself and society, because society highly regulates the means whereby. Each society seems to have strict codes which govern eating, eliminating, sexual behavior, and so on. One of the major goals of Gestalt therapy is to assist the client in the process of maturation, which is defined as the transferring from external support to self-support. The unborn child is completely dependent upon mother for oxygen, food, elimination, and warmth. As soon as the child is born, it begins to depend on itself for breathing, eating, and eliminating. As it grows and matures, it becomes more and more self-supporting. It soon learns to talk, to walk, to feed itself, clothe itself, and so forth. Animals are allowed to contact and explore their environments freely and to develop their inborn instincts and inherited skills. However, in the human being, this transitional period takes many years and it is filled with countless interruptions. The human being who is making contact and curiously exploring his environment constantly hears, don't touch that, be careful, don't go in the street. To pearls, maturation comes through learning, and learning comes through experience. A child can be told a hundred times to stay away from a hot stove, but until the child touches the stove and experiences the heat, no learning will take place. The child learns through his own experience, through the process of discovery. Withdrawals are also interrupted. 
Stop daydreaming and do your homework, or you can't watch TV until your room is cleaned. Some of these interruptions have survival value. Don't go in the street. Stay away from the pool. Don't play with matches. And they do protect the child, whereas the uninterrupted exploring of a young animal could cost it its life. But the great majority of these interruptions are not necessary for survival. They are merely directed at getting the child to conform to the group, whether it be the family, a school, or the society. The human being must learn so many things which are not instinctual. Codes of behavior, reading, writing, arithmetic, manners, parental rules around the house, school regulations, and so on. Another stumbling block to maturation is when the individual experiences a need which is not satisfied by environmental support, and he has not yet developed self-support to gratify the need. The individual experiences an impasse. This is a major turning point in personal growth and in therapy. The individual can resort to unhealthy means of manipulating others into providing support by playing stupid, feigning sickness, playing the good little girl or boy, or being cute or flattering. Or he may continue to develop his own self-support. Any parent who has helped a child with homework has probably observed these manipulations. Unfinished business refers to incomplete gestalts of the past. Any situation which evoked emotion which was not expressed for whatever reason, feelings of love or appreciation, saying goodbye to someone who moved away or passed away, expressions of anger toward parents, teachers, past lovers, children, employers, apologies we owe to people, unexpressed resentments, expressions of forgiveness. The unfinished business of the past distracts the neurotic from living fully in the present. Because of the myriad of unfinished situations, the neurotic becomes confused and tries to avoid them. Pearls would encourage his clients to become aware of themselves, their feelings, actions, gestures, and so on because he trusted the inborn wisdom of the organism. Pearls realize the organism automatically senses and acts on the most pressing need. No decision is required. It is only when the person is out of touch or unaware that he feels forced to make a decision. When the individual is aware, the most important needs will be clear and action will follow without hesitation or conflict. Everything the client does, every hesitation of speech, every bodily movement, every facial reaction expresses some part of the self. The Gestalt therapist does not believe the unconscious to be buried and difficult to reach. He believes it to be right on the surface, gaining expression constantly through the use of nonverbal and intraverbal behaviors. Unbeknownst to himself, the client is always expressing his true feelings. The therapist continually helps the client in number one, gaining awareness of the fact that through his intraverbal behavior and body language, something is being expressed which he may not be aware of. And number two, expressing it directly rather than indirectly, or overtly rather than covertly. Pearls was vehemently against asking a client, why are you crossing your legs, or why are you raising your voice? He believed why questions would only lead to excuses, rationalizations, intellectualizations, and defensiveness. Gestalt therapy heightens the client's awareness to what he is doing and how he is doing it. Once the client fully experiences how he is expressing himself, or how he is interrupting himself, the answer to the question why will come automatically. The simplicity of Gestalt therapy is the belief that real needs can never be repressed. Their direct expression may be inhibited, but they find other ways to gain expression. Everything is on the surface. 
the Gestalt therapist does not focus on the roots of the client's problem. He does not take a life history, nor does he focus on solving the client's problem. He is more concerned about how the client approaches and works to solve his own problem. Rather than focusing on the content of each and every problem the client presents, he focuses on the problem-solving process. Rather than waiting for the client to present material to talk about and analyze, the client's behavior during the therapeutic hour is seen as being the material to be worked on. The neurotic is not seen as a person who underwent some kind of trauma in the past, but rather as a person who is acting in self-defeating ways in the present, perhaps due to past difficulties or even current difficulties. His problem is his reaction to the events in his life, and this always brings the focus of therapy to the here and now. Pearls discussed four neurotic mechanisms. Introjection occurs when we take in something from the environment without digesting and assimilating it. In introjection, we take into ourselves and incorporate concepts about right and wrong, good and bad, prejudices, attitudes, standards for behavior, dress codes, political and religious values, values about marriage, family, education, and so on. We take them in whole, without analyzing them, without deciding if they really fit for us, and if they do, to what degree, and where and when do they seem to be appropriate or inappropriate. With the neurotic mechanism of introjection, there is a tendency to make oneself responsible for that which comes from the environment. Taking in and really believing statements such as, big boys don't cry, good girls don't think about sex, if you want to be loved, you have to do your homework, or clean your room, or finish everything on your plate. The opposite of introjection is projection. Here, the person is unwilling to assume responsibility for his own wishes, feelings, or impulses, and he attaches or attributes them to people and objects in the outside world. Projection runs rampant in the paranoid personality. The paranoid, who believes everyone is out to get him and that he is being persecuted, is in many cases projecting his own desire to persecute others. The sexually inhibited woman may project her sexual aggressiveness onto others and complain that every man she meets is making a pass at her. When the introjector says, I think this is the way it should be, he usually means, they think this is the way it should be, or this is what I've been told by others. When the projector uses the words it or they, he is usually disowning his inner impulses and he should be using the pronoun I. About his teachers he may say, when they want to fail you, you just can't do a thing about it. The projector sees himself as a passive, helpless victim. Frequently, introjection and projection work together. For example, if a person has introjected the belief that if you don't have something good to say about someone, it is better off left unsaid, he may find it difficult to express angry feelings. As the feelings of anger grow, causing more discomfort for the individual, the person may project his anger onto another person, or several people, or perhaps onto a particular group, all men, all women, or all authority figures. In introjection, the contact boundary extends into the individual and he feels responsible for things taken in from his environment. In projection, the contact boundary extends too far into the environment, and the individual's feelings, thoughts, and impulses are attributed to people in the environment. When the individual has no sense of boundary at all between himself and the environment, he experiences a state of confluence. This is where the parts are indistinguishable from one another and from the whole. Newborn infants live in a state of confluence 
they have no ability to discriminate between inside and outside or between the self and others. During moments of ecstasy or deep concentration, adults also experience this state of confluence, a feeling of oneness with the environment. When we participate in rituals or ceremonies, we feel a sense of identification with the group. The boundary between the individual and the group temporarily disappears, and again we experience this state of confluence. Man has a need for contact with other human beings, but when this contact is prolonged, it can be harmful, and the individual may begin to lose all sense of himself. When an individual is experiencing a state of confluence, he is unable to perform his specific job or occupy his role in society. When a part of the body is experiencing a state of confluence, it is unable to perform its particular function. By contracting the muscles of the diaphragm, a person can stop himself from crying. However, when this is done, a person's breathing pattern becomes interrupted. If this is done habitually, the individual will not only lose the ability to cry, but the ability to breathe freely as well. Breathing and the need to cry would become confluent with one another. This type of pathological confluence is at the root of many of the illnesses which we term psychosomatic. The fourth neurotic mechanism is retroflexion. The retroflector does to himself what he would really like to do to other people. He redirects his unacceptable feelings, thoughts, and impulses toward others and turns them inward onto himself. His personality experiences a split. He becomes the persecutor and the persecuted. The neurotic retroflector uses the word myself. He says, I really have to push myself sometimes to get a job done or I'm angry at myself today, or I'm really ashamed of myself for what I did. He talks as if he were two separate people. One of the goals of Gestalt therapy is to help the client discriminate what is really himself and what is not himself, what is really a part of the environment. The Elan Vital, or life force, perceives whatever is in the environment through the sensory system and it stirs the emotions of anger, fear, sexual drives, or grief. The emotional excitement is then transferred to the motoric system to empower it to obtain what is needed from the environment. Every emotion affects the muscular system. If the muscular excitement is not permitted to be released naturally, it will be experienced by the individual as anxiety. If emotional excitement is not allowed expression through some activity, there is a tendency on the part of the individual to desensitize the sensory system, to prevent excitement from building up, and this leads to what is called holes in the personality. Pearls believed people had holes or missing parts in their personalities. Some people have no eyes, no ears, no legs to stand on, no heart. A person without eyes has projected his eyes into the environment. He always feels others are watching him and criticizing him. He is self-conscious, always worrying about how he appears to others. It's as if he has given his eyes away. Gestalt therapy focuses on helping the client regain the use of his sensory equipment so the organismic self-regulation can function in a healthy manner once again. Pearls realized there were two sides to everything. There cannot be day without night. Up would not exist without down. Inside and outside are polar opposites. Love and hate, resentment and appreciation, dependence and independence, fear and desire, the nice guy and the bully, the judge and the protector, the dictator and the weakling. He recognized two parts of the self which are always at odds with one another, the top dog and the underdog. The top dog has a righteous attitude. He is always telling the person what he should and shouldn't do, 
and he threatens the person with what will happen if he disobeys. You should do your homework every day or else you'll grow up to be stupid. You shouldn't use that tone of voice with adults. If you do, you'll get punished. You should use two hands when you ride a bicycle or else you'll fall. The top dog is outspoken and direct. He manipulates with threats. The underdog takes delight in frustrating the demands of the top dog. The underdog says, I promise I'll do it tomorrow. Or I tried to do it, but I couldn't. The underdog is cunning. He is indirect, and he manipulates by failing to live up to the expectations and demands of the top dog. The top dog and underdog battle for control, and when they are not well integrated, the individual develops some kind of self-torture. Sometimes the self-torture game is hidden behind the name self-improvement, and the individual spends year after year torturing himself with new self-improvement programs and always feeling guilty for not living up to his expectations. Pearls did not believe in analyzing. He believed in integrating. He believed dreams were the royal road to integration and that all the parts of the dream were disowned aspects of the dreamer's personality, a disowned part of the self. The dream is seen as an artistic creation in which two opposing forces are brought into the foreground for the purpose of integration. The client is instructed to role-play all the different parts of the dream, even objects such as walkways, staircases, or perhaps the wind or a mountain and to relate how it feels to be that object or person, what his thoughts, feelings, expectations, and fears are. The person may be directed to carry on a dialogue between two people in the dream or two objects. According to Pearls, the holes in the client's personality will become obvious when doing dream work. The client will become confused or sleepy, or try to change the subject when you ask him to play the part of a certain person or object where the whole is located. We have awareness of three zones, awareness of self, awareness of the outer world, and awareness of the intermediate zone. This intermediate zone in Gestalt psychology has been called Maya. This is the zone of fantasy activity, or what has also been called the mind. This is where all our imagined fears exist, all our interjects, all our concepts about the roles we play. This is where we play at expressing our inner feelings and acting out our emotions. This is where we yell and scream at our boss or make love to the beautiful woman. Pearls encouraged his clients to lose their minds and come to their senses, to be in touch with the world and to be in touch with their true selves. He cautioned, anxiety is the gap between now and later. Whenever you mentally leave the present and fantasize about what will happen in the future, you experience anxiety. Pearls believed clients would come into therapy because they wanted to change something about themselves they didn't like or get rid of some discomfort, a chronic feeling of tension or anxiety, reoccurring headaches, undesirable habits. But whereas the client often preferred to avoid the discomfort and eagerly wanted to implement changes, Pearls believed change could only come through a willingness to first experience how you are, to experience fully what it is that you are doing and how you are doing it. He believed the client's discomfort was due to some kind of interruption in the organismic self-regulating process. The client would be asked to focus on or stay with the pain or discomfort or the unpleasant feeling and not to push it away or change the subject. By staying with the discomfort, the client can learn how he is causing it. The client may find that he is clenching his teeth or tightening his stomach muscles, for example. The client may be instructed to exaggerate the behavior, clench his jaw harder, and tighten his stomach muscles even more. Through this process of exaggeration, the client often comes to discover what the purpose of the behavior is. He may say, when I clench my teeth or tighten my stomach, 
It helps me hold back from yelling and screaming and really losing control of myself. Or it helps stop myself from crying. The therapist, realizing this clenching and tightening is a self-interruption, will ask the client to yell and scream in an empty chair in which he might imagine the person he is so angry at. Or he might ask the client if he would like to cry. It is the client's self-interruption which leads to the development of psychosomatic symptoms. The clenching may lead to reoccurring headaches, the tightening to breathing difficulties, or perhaps stuttering. When the client accepts his deeper feelings and expresses them openly, the undesirable feeling or behavior will cease. Change only occurs by going deep into yourself and accepting the feelings which are there. This is the paradox of change. Fighting a symptom and holding in the feelings only seems to make it worse. Pearls conducted individual therapy in a group setting. One person in the group would work at a time. The hot seat is the chair the person sits on who is doing the therapeutic work. Pearls would have an empty chair so the client could change seats and carry on a dialogue between two parts of himself or two elements of a dream. The client is asked to begin his therapeutic journey with the sentence, Now I am aware. Each word is hand chosen for a specific purpose. The word now keeps the client in the present. It reminds him that even when we refer to past events, we must be aware of what we are currently experiencing. Rather than listening to verbalizations about the client's problems, and rather than trying to figure out why the client is having problems, the client is instructed to act out or relive the problem or trauma as if it were occurring right now, and to become aware of his emotional and behavioral reactions. It also helps remind the client that the present moment is always changing. Time cannot be frozen or stopped, even for an instant. And that, of course, means the client must accept the fact that he and his feelings are also in the process of constant change. Pearl's analogy of the record playing is an excellent one. Music can only be heard when the record and needle are in contact, and only the pattern on the record which is in contact with the needle will be heard, not the pattern which will be in contact in two seconds, or the pattern which was in contact two seconds ago. The future is not yet. The past is no more. And also, if the record were stopped, the music too would stop. It seems the music can only be heard if the process is allowed to continue. It cannot be stopped, not even for an instant. The word I is used to increase the client's sense of responsibility for his thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and neurotic symptoms. It prevents him from acting like a passive, helpless victim. The word am heightens the client's awareness to the fact that what he calls his feelings, emotions, thoughts, and behaviors, as if they belong to him, are actually who he is. The word aware provides the client with a fresh look at himself, of how he expresses himself, and of how he inhibits his self-expression. Pearls always emphasized being aware of nonverbal and intraverbal behavior, feelings, emotions, bodily sensations, breathing changes, facial expressions, gestures, fantasies, a confused look, a lowering of the voice, a raising of the voice, a tapping of the hand on the arm of a chair, a moistening of the eyes, sitting up straight all of a sudden, avoiding eye contact. He believed nonverbal and intraverbal behavior was more authentic and a truer expression of the real self. Without awareness, the client experiences a sense of being stuck. Awareness helps the client realize he has choices. By increasing the client's scope of awareness, he learns that feelings and behaviors in one aspect of his life are related to feelings and behaviors in another aspect, be it past 
or present. According to Pearls, the neurosis is comprised of five layers. The first is the cliché layer. This consists of all the trivial social courtesies. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Hope all is going well with you and your family. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome. Well, take care now. Have a real nice day. The second layer is the layer of games and roles. The very important person, the bully, the crybaby, the nice guy, the good little girl, the helper, the sick helpless person, the manager. This is the social as-if layer. We act as if we're more intelligent, more assertive, more polite than we honestly feel. If this role-playing is taken away from the neurotic, he feels an emptiness, a nothingness, a kind of non-existence or impasse. People avoid this level fiercely, and they go back to playing their roles very quickly. But if they continue beyond the roles they play, they will experience the fourth layer, the implosive or death layer. When a person is willing to experience this deadness, it begins to change into the fifth layer, the explosive layer, where the true self exists. Actually, only the roles and neurotic games die, and this allows the real self to come through. The four types of explosion which take place are explosion into grief, into orgasm, into anger, and into joy or laughter. The practice of Gestalt therapy consists of rules and games. The rules are always explained at the beginning of therapy. The games are only used where applicable and are explained at that time. All rules and games are utilized to increase the client's awareness, sense of responsibility, self-support, and maturation. The first rule is that the client is required to speak in the present tense. This is an extremely effective procedure for integrating past memories, dreams, and experiences. The client must stay in the now. The therapist continually directs the client's awareness to what he is doing and how he is doing it. Awareness of feelings, emotions, gestures, hesitations, facial reactions, and body posture is our most certain knowledge. Perceptions of the outer world can easily be wrong. Even our memories of past experiences tends to change over time. Present self-awareness is the only thing about us we can ever really know to be true. The second rule requires the client to be a good communicator. He is made aware of the fact that every communication has a sender and a receiver. He must take responsibility for being the sender of every utterance, every gesture, every motion he makes, and relate toward whom he wishes to express this feeling or take this action. The third rule requires the client to use I language. It makes the client take full responsibility for his body parts, behaviors, and actions. Instead of saying about his hand, it is trembling, the client would say, I am trembling. Instead of, sometimes my behavior is hostile, sometimes I am hostile. Instead of, my eyes are watery, I am crying. When the client says, I can't, the therapist again makes him take responsibility and say, I won't. The client may say, I could never tell my husband how I really feel. I just couldn't do it. And the therapist may say, say I won't. I won't tell my husband how I really feel. Another rule is that gossiping is not permitted. This is talking about someone who is actually present. We often avoid talking directly to people because we cannot deal with the feelings they arouse in us. Here the person is required to address the party directly and deal with the dreaded feeling. Another rule is that questions are not permitted. Often the questioner is not needing information, 
but rather is hiding deeper feelings of anger, hurt, hostility, and fear. Pearls believe that a statement or a command was a truer expression of the self, and he would make his clients take responsibility for their questions by turning them around. A client might ask, don't you think my parents were a little harsh at times? To which the therapist may respond, say, I think my parents were harsh at times. Or a client might ask, it doesn't hurt children if you only spank them once in a while, does it? When he may really be feeling concerned that he has hurt his children. Or a client might ask, why don't you say something when someone comes in late? When she may really mean to tell the latecomer, I get upset when people are late. I wish you'd make it a point to be on time. Or one of the group members may say to another, Mary, why do you always cry so easily? When he may really wish to say, I feel like I have to censor everything I want to say because it might hurt you. I wish you'd stop crying so much. The client uses questions to avoid responsibility. To him, responsibility means blame. It means he is at fault. It means he has contributed to his own problem. To the therapist, responsibility means freedom. For if the problem is in no way connected to the client's behavior, he has no power to change it. But if it is, he has the ability to change his feelings, his behavior, and hence his life situation. The Gestalt therapist believes each person has response, ability, that is, the ability to choose his emotional or behavioral response, the ability to control his actions and reactions in any situation. Following is a brief description of a number of the games used in Gestalt therapy. In an attempt to assist the client in his work toward integration, the therapist looks for disowned aspects of the personality and instructs the client to have a dialogue with a disowned part. The client may hate aggressive people and the therapist would say, talk to the aggressive part of yourself sitting in that empty chair over there. The client can carry on a dialogue between any polar opposite parts of his personality, between the aggressive and passive parts, between the nice guy and the scoundrel, between the masculine and the feminine parts, between the right hand and the left hand, or between the upper body and the lower body. There can also be dialoguing between the client and a significant other, such as a parent, a spouse, a child, a teacher, or between two objects appearing in a dream, a dog and a cat, the sky and the ground, the wind and the trees, the steering wheel of a car, and the brakes. Another game is called Unfinished Business. Here, the client is instructed to complete any unfinished situations which may be identified. He may say goodbye to a lost loved one. He may apologize to someone he has wronged. The client may express any feelings which have been held in. Anger, resentments, appreciation, love, guilt, disappointments, and so forth. In the game called I Take Responsibility, the client is asked to take responsibility for everything he does or fails to do. The client may say, I am aware my voice is getting louder and I take responsibility for it. I am aware that I just crossed my legs and I take responsibility for it. I am aware that I am very quiet and I take responsibility for it. I am aware that I do not want to express my feelings to my boss, and I take responsibility for it. Another game is called Playing the Projection. Much of what we believe to be perceptions are really projections. A person who says, I don't want to say what I'm feeling because it might hurt someone, would be asked to play the part of the overly sensitive person to uncover his own inner conflict. In the game of reversals, the client is asked to play the part of the opposite of what he presents. 
Pearls realized that a person's overt behavior would often mask the existence of its polar opposite. The shy, inhibited client may be asked to play the part of an exhibitionist. The weak client plays the part of a dictator. The business-like woman plays the part of a flirt. By playing the opposite role, the client makes contact with the disowned part of his true self. In the game entitled The Rhythm of Contact and Withdrawal, the client who seems to be withdrawing is encouraged to do so. Withdrawal is not seen as resistance. It is part of a rhythmic pattern. When the client seems to be withdrawing, he is not stopped, but rather he is encouraged to close his eyes and engage in whatever fantasy he wishes. When he opens his eyes, he is asked to relate his fantasy. It is important to be aware of our fantasies because they often provide clues about our present difficulties, about what is missing in our lives at the current time. The game of exaggeration helps the client gain insight into the underlying meaning of his gestures and body language. If the client taps his hand on the table, he will be asked to tap it harder and harder, again and again. If he crosses his legs at a particular point, he may be asked to cross them tightly until he knows why he has crossed them. In the repetition game, the client is asked to repeat a phrase or sentence he has spoken which was important, but which he glossed over as if to indicate he was out of touch with his feelings. He will be instructed to say it again, possibly several times. If the therapist senses anger, he may tell the client to say it louder. If sadness and tears are suspected, the therapist will ask the client to speak it in a quiet voice. In addition to encouraging clients to take responsibility for all their feelings, actions, gestures, and so on, clients are encouraged to shed responsibility for others. The client may say, if I told my husband my real feelings, he would be hurt and embarrassed. And the therapist would say, let him take responsibility for his reaction. Pearls believed it was essential to stop blaming parents for being the cause of all your problems. He encouraged his clients to forgive their parents and to take full responsibility for their lives. According to Pearls, unexpressed anger would be transformed into sadism, a drive for power, and various means of torturing oneself and others. He saw guilt as unexpressed resentment, and where there is resentment, there is always its opposite, appreciation. Whenever a person experiences difficulty communicating with someone, he must first express his resentments, then make his requests or demands, and then state his appreciations of the other person. Pearls believed every individual, every plant, and every animal is born with one goal, to actualize itself as it is. In Gestalt psychology, self-actualization does not mean the developing of all one's potentials to become fully what one is capable of becoming. That is a future orientation, and Gestalt psychology focuses on the present. Self-actualization is very simply being what one is now. He pointed out that no natural plant or animal exists which will prevent its own growth as a human being does. He would have liked to see the word neuroses replaced by the term growth disorder. Pearls warned against self-image actualizing, the purposeful shaping of behavior, attitudes, and appearance based on a perfect role model. The person is so concerned about projecting the right image or making a good impression that he may lose his sense of self in the process. Pearls believed a healthy person would allow the situation to control his actions. What he meant by this is that whenever we enter a situation with a rigid game plan or agenda, we lose the wisdom of the organism to react spontaneously and appropriately to the situation. 
it is frequently observed in sports that the great athletes are those who can change their game plan in midstream if necessary. And people are often heard to say, when I finally decided to just be myself and not worry about the speech, I did much better. Pearls believe life depends on taking what we need from the environment. In eating, we bite, chew, grind, liquefy, swallow, and then digest food. Then we metabolize and assimilate it. The organism takes what it needs and makes it part of itself. What is not needed is dispelled through the process of elimination. Pearls believed a truly healthy person would deal with psychological matters in the same way. Knowledge, behavioral standards, ethical standards, sense of aesthetics, political and religious values all stem from people in the outside world around us. But if we are to be healthy, we must critically analyze, digest, and assimilate them like food, keeping what we want, what seems to be right for us, and eliminating the rest. This concludes the presentation.